Welcome to the Skeptic Zone, the podcast from Australia for science and reason. Yes, it's the Skeptic Zone podcast, episode number 736, for the 13th of November 2022. Richard Saunders coming to you early in the morning. The sun is not risen. The birds are singing, though, here in Sydney, Australia. And we are just uh, today waiting for storms to roll through. More rain, hopefully not more flooding. In the past week, my friends, we've lost a couple of major characters, major people in the world of skepticism and magic. A lovely magician by the name of Max Marvin died in the uh, the past week or so, and I met Max at uh, the Amazing Meeting in Las Vegas some years ago when I was uh, part of the organizing committee for the Million Dollar Challenge, James Randi Million Dollar Challenge, and I don't remember the exact challenge we were dealing with, but Max Marvin was there to cast an eye over some of our protocols and generally interact, and Although I didn't meet him very often, maybe once or twice, I know he was a giant figure in the world of uh, magic, conjuring, the conjuring arts, and a good friend of James Randi. And then we heard of the death of a, a giant in the history of modern skepticism, Kendrick Fraser, the longtime editor of the Skeptical Inquirer magazine, I met Kendrick on a number of occasions in Las Vegas, for sure, probably at other PSYCON meetings. But in more recent years, I had the pleasure of meeting uh, Ken in Albuquerque, New Mexico, where he lived when I was visiting Ben Radford. So later on in the show, in the Trove segment, we'll be looking at some of the press reports about Kendrick Fraser going back very many years and his skeptical activities. But what else do we have coming up this week? We're going to start with me uh, reminiscing a little bit, but uh, reading out a letter I received many years ago, almost 20 years ago, from a correspondent who was not very happy. Not very happy with me in particular and the skeptical movement for our um, lack of action. What's that all about? An interesting and sad letter coming up at the top of the show. Following that, it's another reference to Kendrick Fraser in a way. Adrian Hill looks at his daughter, Michelle, who became known as Lady Ganga. And uh, sadly, she died some years ago. Why she became noteworthy, why she's known as Lady Ganga, find out coming up with Adrian Hill. Then we have more reports, more on-the-spot interviews from Rob Palmer at uh, the recent PSYCON, the Committee for Skeptical Inquiries Convention in Las Vegas. And amongst other people this week, uh, Rob catches up with my friend and fellow podcaster from the data skeptic, Carl Polish. Then to round off, as I mentioned before, the Trove segment with uh, reports on Kendrick Fraser. Now, Sydney people, if you haven't done so already... Head to SkepticZone.tv, look at the show notes for this week, and you'll see a link to the upcoming Skeptics in the Pub on the night of the 24th of this month, Thursday. Downtown Sydney, we have a wonderful lineup of skeptical people for you to meet, including the ESP podcast, all the way from Europe, Claire Klingenberg, all the way from Europe, and Dr. Carl Kruselninski, all the way from uh, Sydney. All those wonderful people will be there to give little presentations and mingle and chat with you, take your questions, all at Skeptics in the Pub coming up. But places are limited, so head for SkepticZone.tv or head for Meetup and look for Australian Skeptics and uh, register your seat, as it were. Also, another plea, if you know friends or family who live in the Australian Capital Territory or nearby... Uh, don't forget to let them know there's a sceptical convention coming up at the uh, 
at the National Library of Australia, and that will be on the 3rd and 4th of December. Wonderful stars appearing there, including the aforementioned ESP podcast and Claire Klingenberg and a host of local uh, scientists and other speakers. The Australian Skeptics National Convention and if you go to skepticon.org.au, all the information is there. But really, if you do have friends or family who live in Canberra or the surrounding areas, uh, a favour to me, please let them know about this convention because it would be very easy indeed for them to go along and have a wonderful weekend, the 3rd and 4th of December. And don't forget, on Saturday night at the convention, there is the annual Australian Skeptics Dinner, free course meal and guest speaker. And you can book all that at skepticon.org.au. And we'll all get to know who will win the Bent Spoon Award this year. But now it's time for me to run downstairs. And as the sun, yes, looking out the window there, the sky is turning a little bit brighter as the sun rises before the rain falls. I think I'll have a bowl of soup with crusty toast. Sounds good to me. Mm. While I do that, I hope you enjoy The Skeptic Zone. Folks, over the years, of the 20 odd years, very odd years, I've been involved in the skeptical movement. I've received lots of correspondence, you can imagine. Mostly, I'm very pleased to say, mostly it's been quite positive. Letters about the skeptic zone or the Australian skeptics or some work we might have done. Not floods of it, but it's very nice. But of course, of course, we get the other side. We get people writing to us because they think we're evil. We get people writing to us because they think we're just plainly wrong in this or that area. People get uh, very annoyed with us, angry with us from time to time because we don't uh, happen to believe in their pet subject or we're not skeptical of the same thing they are skeptical of. And that fits broadly in the within the logical fallacy of relative privation And you can hear more about that fallacy if you go down to the link on SkepticZone.tv, down the right side of the page, the picture of Michelle Bickersma, who two years ago did a series of 40 logical fallacies, which we broadcast on the Skeptic Zone, and they're all there now on YouTube. And you've probably heard the, uh, the promotions for those over the years in the supermarket where the skeptical fairy godmother angel from the internet comes down and tells Adrian and Susan about the logical fallacies. If you haven't heard those, I would recommend you go to that link because they're all there in uh, in very handy time codes so you can hear each one. They, they all go for about five minutes. But I digress. Yes, we've received many letters. Many letters. And another aspect is people will write to us because they think we can instantly fix or change or do something. How often have we heard the expression, ah, you skeptics, you know, you should attack this, do this, fix this, bring this person to justice, stop this going on, as if we can all ride in on a white horse and say, aha, villain, we have you. If only. Now this brings me to one of the more interesting letters I've received over the years. And I'm sure our editor, Tim Mendham of The Skeptic Magazine, could probably fill a thousand episodes of The Skeptic Zone with the interesting correspondence he gets. But I'll read this one. No name, partly because the name is too hard to read. It's a squiggle signature, and I can sort of make it out a little bit, but I really can't. The letter appears to be typed, as in with a typewriter, and it dates from nearly 20 years ago. And it's the result, I believe, 
It's the result of me appearing on the television show called A Current Affair almost 20 years ago when I was talking about the so-called medium John Edward. Now, John Edward, before the pandemic, would come to Australia twice a year for very many years. Once in the middle of the year to promote his uh, tour, which would occur in the end of the year, the end of the year, around November, December. And whenever John Edward stepped foot in the country, he would be instantly picked up by radio, television programs, and um, hardly a skeptical word was said. So I was asked to appear on one of these shows, and I gave my opinion that uh, John Edward was probably using tried and true staged cold reading routines and etc. Anyway, so I think this is why this letter was sent to me via Australian Skeptics. Here we go. Dear Mr. Saunders, I am aware of your organization. Blandly called Skeptics is nothing but a bunch of publicity-seeking blowhards. My opinion, confirmed by your recent limp-wristed attack on John Edward, your weak bleatings in no way proved him a fraud. Edward alleviated his Australian audiences of $1 million, perhaps more. So, evidently, my opinion of your bag of wind club is shared by at least one other person. Again, sometimes I wonder what these people expect we can magically do. We read on. I previously wrote to you. Now, I'm not sure when he says I previously wrote to you, whether he means me personally, because I didn't receive anything before, or you as in the Australian skeptics. I suspect it means the Australian skeptics. I previously wrote to you about a chiropractic practice called the Activator, which is as effective as a stick with a star stuck on the end. Not unexpectedly, my letter was rudely ignored, the subject not being headline material. Gutless, though your bag of wind club undoubtedly is, I would like to alert someone, anyone, about two more rorts in chiropractic practice. Now I'll read these uh, paragraphs. I'm not exactly sure of some of the terminology, so please give me a little bit of leeway here. The Pettibon technique, originating from an American technique peddler of the same name. This concerns the skull's foramen magnum with the atlas vertebrae. Restoration to the correct position of these two anatomical parts will cure all mankind's sufferings. The sacro-occipital technique, performed with the aid of two wedges strategically placed, with a 180 kilogram male might have some effect. On a 50 kilogram girl is about as effective as a feather in the wind. This correspondent certainly likes talking about the wind. All of these cure-all techniques will not stand the test of Newton's laws. Hmm. If you are, as I suspect, nothing but a bunch of pimples on the asshole of time, you will ignore this letter as you did my first. However, I personally challenge you to investigate the facts I have raised, but I suspect you will fail again dismally, as you did with Edward. Yours, etc., etc. So it's interesting that uh, I did what I could. Almost 20 years ago, I did what I could. I, we alerted the media. The media came to us. We publicized the fact what we thought of Edward. But somehow, and not unsurprisingly, the rest of the media were happy to have John Edward on because they know he rates. And he did his shows and he left that somehow we have failed dismally. Well, I wish there was more we could do or I wish that more of the media would pay attention to what we say after over 40 years of the Australian Skeptics I think we've earned the right to uh, some respect, but that's not how this works at all. And we can look at it that uh, in the 50 plus years of the modern skeptical movement, uh, it's clear that no 
psychic, clairvoyant, anyone with a paranormal claim has stepped up to demonstrate their claim and change the mind of science, sort of really doesn't matter. Because as soon as somebody comes along who is newsworthy and uh, the media know it, then that person will get publicity. That's simply the way it works. But I will say, of course, we have our successes. We have made or brought about many changes, softly, quietly, slowly, sometimes with a lot of effort indeed, a lot of effort mostly by volunteers. I think of our friends at the Good Thinking Society in the UK in their fight against homeopathy on the national health over there. They have had wonderful success in making huge inroads, and they should be applauded for that. But it's not as if, and I get back to my earlier point, it's not as if people can write to us and say, do something about this, that, or the other, and we say, right, here we go, where's the white horse? Gallop, 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 we got you. It just doesn't work like that. And it's interesting how many people get quite angry with the skeptics because, once again, we're not skeptical of the things they're skeptical of, mostly politicians. We might be skeptical of politicians, but it's sort of outside the sphere of what we do. Personally, my speciality is the old-fashioned stuff, the ghosts, the UFOs, the ESP, the cold reading, the Bigfoots, the, uh, the uh, water divining and that sort of stuff. More recently, we have people more interested in conspiracy theories and uh, medical fraud, homeopathy and that sort of thing. But no matter the topic, no matter the skeptical topic, it's not as if we can just, as I say, write in and make things change, despite the disappointment shown almost 20 years ago by this correspondent. And I must say, in closing, that I've been called many things in my time being in the skeptical movement. The anti-vaxxers, the Australian Vaccination Network, or their ilk, called me a mouseketeer, only evil. But to be called a pimple on the asshole of time, I think that takes the cake. I wonder how many of my skeptical colleagues in the uh, podcasting business and the magazine business also receive interesting letters. I think I might have a word to Tim Mendham. I think he, he would have a few to show me. Hey, this is Dr. Carl, Carl Krasinski, proud to be a skeptic, and you can find out more about me at drcarl.com and get lots of free stuff there as well. You can count on Adrian with Adrian Hill. Hello everyone, this is Adrienne Hill from Canada, here to talk about a courageous but sad story that many of you may not know. As Richard noted in the introduction, a friend of science and skeptical thinking, Kendrick Fraser, died this week. I never had the pleasure of meeting Kendrick, though I had hoped to meet him at PsyCon, as he was scheduled to speak at the opening remarks, but could not attend due to his declining health. I wanted to meet him because I had written the Wikipedia page for his daughter, Michelle, in 2021. Susan Gerbeck keeps a running list of possible pages for us GSOW editors to work on, and this was one she suggested that I should take on. By writing her Wikipedia page, I became quite attached to her and her story, so I hope you find her tale as inspirational as I did. Michelle was diagnosed with cervical cancer in 2009 after going 10 years without having a pap test, partially due to not having health insurance. The cancer recurred, unfortunately, despite undergoing chemotherapy and radiation, and she was given only three to six months to live. A visit to a friend's place in California, where she took up stand-up paddleboarding, morphed into a plan to raise awareness of the human papillomavirus or HPV vaccine and the importance of regular screening. 
Michelle decided to stand up paddleboard down the Ganges River, or the Ganga as it is called in India, starting at Rushukesh and finishing at the Hindu holy city of Varanasi. She chose India partly because she had been to the country before as a 19-year-old where she discovered Buddhism, and partly because of the high incidence of cervical cancer deaths there. This 25-day, 1,100-kilometer adventure set a woman's world record for paddleboarding and attracted the attention of local and American media. Michelle's friend and filmmaker, Nat Stone, accompanied her to record the journey and to operate a support boat that contained camera equipment and supplies. For 10 to 12 hours each day, Michelle stood paddling and performing Tibetan prayers for the dying, sometimes stopping to give local children rides on her paddleboard. People would line the river watching for the woman they had nicknamed Lady Ganga. Ten weeks after returning from this remarkable journey, Michelle died at her home in Albuquerque. She was only 45. Three years after Michelle's death, in 2015, filmmakers Mark Hefty and Frederick Lumiere released a beautiful, award-winning documentary called Lady Ganga, Nilza's Story, which you can watch by finding the link in the show notes. I highly recommend watching this documentary, but I will warn you, have some tissue ready. And if you would like to find out more about this incredible woman and her story, check out the Wikipedia page titled Lady Ganga. Until next time, this is Adrian Hill. Hello. Hey San, hey San. Did you know the European continent is home to almost 750 million people living in 50 different countries, belonging to an even greater number of ethnicities? And believe it or not, only a handful of them list English as the first or at least one of the official languages. And there's an amazing amount of skeptical activism going on out there that you are not aware of because it's not in English. Yeah, because you know, pseudoscience, quackery and fake news do not stop at borders. They get translated to other languages and transferred across the whole world. So, if you're interested in weekly updates on what's going on in some of the countries here, providing you with all the interesting facts, news and even some skeptical history. Or if you want to hear interviews in English with brilliant people you sometimes haven't even heard about. Then what you need is to subscribe to the ESP. Extrasensory Perception. You must be really wrong. No, the ESP as in... The, the European, European Skeptics, Skeptics Podcast. Podcast. That's right. And if you're wondering how you can find us online, go to theesp.eu. And you can also find us on Twitter at espodcast underscore eu. Or you can like us on Facebook. And if you want to subscribe, do a quick search on all the intertubes for the European Skeptics Podcast. You'll find us on SoundCloud, iTunes, Stitcher, Spotify and all the rest. The European Skeptics Podcast. The, the real ESP, ESP experience. experience. I don't know how you can believe. Here's another PsyCon conference attendee who is willing to share his story with Skeptic Zone listeners. Please introduce yourself. My name is Kyle Polich, longtime Skeptic Zone listener. I do believe I've heard your voice in the podcast land. Yeah, yeah, I host the Data Skeptic podcast, and I'm fortunate to get the promo on uh, Skeptic Zone every so often. Is this your first conference? No, no, I was at one PsyCon before the great pandemic, and a couple of times before that. Uh, but this is my first actually even big event out since things kicked off. I've been kind of a hermit. I saw you on Susan's Trivia for uh, one episode, and we were talking about whether you were going to come, and you were really hedging it. So my understanding is you booked this really late, and therefore you're not at this great hotel. You have to walk some great number of miles to get here, right? I have a 30-minute walk, which is a well-enjoyed walk. <laughs> An hour a day is a good little bit of exercise. <laughs> What have you enjoyed about the conference besides getting the exercise in? Um, I mean, like any good skeptics conference, seeing familiar faces and new faces and getting to have the kind of water cooler discussions that you can't quite get uh, on a podcast or on a Zoom. 
Um, but of course, some outstanding talks as well, and a couple of... Yeah, what were your favorites? Well, um, there were some great lectures, but if I had to pull out favorites, I think it might be some of the Neil deGrasse Tyson moments, or even today's session with Penn Jillette, which I felt were like uh, in the family events. Like I heard a couple of stories I'd never heard before. I almost skipped Penn, because I've heard him so many times. Um, Julia Sweeney pulled interesting stuff out of She sure did, yeah. And I heard a, a nuanced approach to ways in which I thought I understood him before and I didn't quite. And, well, but uh, it also, he talked about, like, we're, none of us are the same person we were some years ago, and he, including himself. Yeah. So even whatever you understood him to be before, I think he's admitting he's changed. And those are the skeptical moments to celebrate, right? Right. I have always hated when they say someone's a flip-flopper like it's bad. Like, that's the thing you want. You right. get new evidence, you update right. your beliefs. And what was the thing that changed his mind about... He, I would still say he's a libertarian. I, I think he would say that's that. That's fine. But, but he has changed from, like, a hardcore libertarian because he got an, e, no, an email about yeah. something. What was the story there? There was a big anti-mask rally being planned in Las Vegas. And not only did they reach out to him, like, will you host this? But it was just presumptive, like, of course you will host this, <laughs> as if there was no discussion about it. And, yeah, and, and he is not an anti-masker or an anti-vaxxer and, and took such an exception to this that it made him rethink his positions. The free thinker in him that kindled yeah. that spirit, yeah. That was impressive. So tomorrow we get a little bit more time for PsyCon uh, on Sunday, so what are your plans for that day? Well, obviously the Sunday papers, which are a big highlight to the closeout of the conference. You get to hear new ideas and up-and-coming speakers and get a more like intimate setting to hear what's going on in people's thoughts. And there's something about Skeptoy doing something. What's Indeed, yeah. There's. Um, I'm not like, clear on it. I'm not totally either. My interpretation of it from skimming an email I, that I probably should have read better before talking on another podcast about it was that it was sort of an invitation to listeners to come and uh, hear maybe a little about what they're being planning and get some feedback on what you'd like to hear more of and maybe less of on the show and that sort of thing. Yeah, that, that was my take on it too. Well, so we'll see how that goes. Yeah. Okay, thank you for your time. My pleasure. So it's still Saturday night. And uh, there's only a little bit of the uh, Saigon conference left, which is the Sunday morning papers. But I have run into somebody. Please introduce yourself. Hi, this is Carl with a K. And uh, it says press on your badge. So what's that all about? Uh, I am a quasi-official, unofficial photographer for the convention. So I've noticed you're sitting in the first row taking pictures with very good photographic equipment of all the speakers. And I do recall I have seen your name on a lot of the Wikipedia photos for these people. Yes. Uh, that's why I get to sit in the front row. I get all the good pictures. And then Susan, later on when they write articles, will say, hey, did you get a photo of this speaker? And I say, Susan, I got, Gar Susan Garbick. Susan Garbick. And I'll say, I got a photo of all the speakers. <laughs> and they're all very high quality. And in fact, I think the one that's on my Facebook page is one you took when I was doing the Sunday Papers. I believe so, uh, three, yeah. Three or four years ago. You leaning so casually <laughs> against the lectern. <laughs> Trying to look like I was not nervous at all. I do and recall not that. only do my photos get used for Wikipedia articles, they get used for Skeptical Inquirer articles, and my photo of Joe Kuzinski got used for the Japanese edition of his book. Did they point that out? That it was your photo? Yes. Well, they, they asked my permission. I granted permission. And they, uh, I didn't ask for money. I just said, give me a couple copies of the book. And they sent me five copies of the book. So what got you involved in all of this? Uh, every conference I've been to, which is, this is my fourth one, you've been there. And I know you were involved way before me. So what got you involved in this whole skeptical movement? Well, to try and not go too long a story and what seems interesting to me, but probably not so much to everyone else, uh, way back 2008-ish, for years, I had been you know, using the web to find scientific information and other technical information. And my friend, Scott, used to have a blog called Polite Descent. And one of the things he did on this website was he wrote medical reviews of TV shows and comic books and stuff like that. He would grade the medicine in it. And he linked to some other sites one of which was Respectful Insolence from uh, ORAC. I guess it's David Gorski. Everyone knows that I'm now. pretty sure now, yeah. So it's not a secret anymore. And from David Gorski's Respectful Insolence, I found Neurologica and Science Based Medicine and, and the James Randi's site and everything. Quickly became a James Randi fan 
And one year after TAM 6, had the amazing meeting 6 had happened, my friend Scott and I started talking, saying, you know, Randy just, he went through that cancer thing real recently. If we want to ever see him in person, we need to go to the amazing meeting next year because he may not be around much longer. And so he and I, the next year, went to the amazing meeting seven. But both of us are naturally like introverted people. So we stuck together the whole time and pretty much... Did you did, get did, to talk to Randy? I, I, would, I was not brave enough to talk to Randy that year. <laughs> and, but like we, we didn't do anything but hang around with each other basically the whole time. And we went again the next year and kind of did the same thing. But the following year, he wasn't able to go. And your friend. My friend Scott was not able to attend. And so I had to make the decision whether to go all by myself, which is something I generally don't do or not go, and I couldn't not go, and so I just overcame my anxiety and went by myself and got started meeting people because I was just completely on my own. And I, if, I, Yeah, I hear that's one of the good things about yeah. the conference for a, yeah. a lot of people, yeah. that they do what they normally wouldn't have done is to meet other people and get more involved. And it helps if you can get into the orbit of Susan Kerbick, <laughs> because you will meet all sorts and of people she's got who are very large friendly. Gravitational field. Yeah. I'm not commenting on her weight. Yeah, she's got she's got a, a skeptical gravitas. Yeah, and she knows everyone, and everyone knows her. So once Susan is your friend, you're going to get a whole bunch of other friends. And did you get to meet Randy? I did get to meet Randy several times over the next few years because, I mean, he's gone now, unfortunately, but. You know, he was around for TAM 7, TAM 8, TAM 9, TAM 11, 12, 13, and then SciCon 2016, 2017. And so you eventually got what you wanted out of it the first time you came, and plus the skeptical movement got you as a great resource. Yes. Okay, very good. And we're both better for it. So, by the way, I don't know if you have ever been on the skeptic zone. But, I have no. But, but I think you were on a different podcast. I was on episode... 402 of the Skeptic's Guide to the Universe. How did that happen? Well, at the amazing meeting, the, the SGU would often have this dinner for friends of the SGU, and uh, like at the end of the, toward the end of the night, they would hold an auction, like two auctions. One was a guest appearance on science or fiction, and the other was for a guest appearance as a guest rogue for the whole episode. And I won that auction. How much was that? Do you want to say? I don't, I don't think they want me to say okay. what my winning bid was. <laughs> All right. So let me ask instead, was the experience as good as you thought it might be? It was. Uh, I really enjoyed it. Thank you, Carl, for your time. Thank you. Just finished the last official event of Saturday at SciCon, and I ran into a fellow Skeptical Inquirer author. So tell us a little bit about you. Hi, my name is J.D. Sword. I write the co-write the Morning Heresy, the column The Devil in the Details, and host the podcast of the same name, Devil in the Details. And I've seen your articles in the Skeptical Inquirer online. Yes. Right. And you, you have a topic that's sort of uh, unique. What, what do you like to write about? Uh, mostly cases of exorcism, demonic possession, cases about some haunted houses and stuff, QAnon material. How'd you get interested in all of that stuff? Uh, well, for me, it really started with Pizzagate in 2016. When that first happened, I immediately drew parallels between that and the Satanic Panic of the 80s, and I was like, you know, this is something that we need to look out for. So that partially inspired me to get more involved with reaching out to people from the Center for Inquiry, and from there it just kind of snowballed to getting a column and being an active writer. Yeah, so that was the first thing I saw, that, that your article started popping up on Skeptical Inquirer online. And then recently I saw your name on the, the Morning Heresy. How did that part happen? So I don't remember exactly how that started. And by the I way, was, for people who don't know the Morning Heresy, I should say, is well, you describe it. <laughs> what is the Morning Heresy? Uh, well, it's a newsletter. It's kind of a roundup of any kind of news stories that the skeptic community might might be interested in. I co co-write it with the uh, new communications guy, Jeff Dellinger. Paul oh. Fidalgo is still involved in it. I, I had reached out to to him and Barry and, you know, asked, if, you know, is there anything else that I can do and get involved in? And honestly, I don't really remember how it how the topic came up, but 
You, you, you know what? I remember now because it's when he got the new job. Paul, and when, I, Paul, Paul, got, when the Paul got the new job with Free Inquiry, I had messaged Barry and I said, do you know what the future of that's going to be? Or are you looking for somebody to contribute in any way? And at the time he was like, you know, oh, I don't really know what it's going to be. And I think Paul had reached out to me and was like, you know, I don't know what the future is necessarily going to be, but I'd be very interested if you'd be willing to, to do some work for it. Oh, so, great. you know, let's give it a give it a couple couple weeks. We'll try it out and see how it goes. And apparently he, he liked, liked what I had to say. I am always impressed by that, that email when it comes because how did these people have the time to research all of this and put all of this <laughs> in one day? And, and, and yours have been the same way. He, he has a very extensive list of key, keyword searches and sources to peruse through. He taught me all the kind of tricks. And some, some days it's, it's less busy than others. Um, and then other days you get absolute gold mines of, you know, I can't believe that I'm writing about this. This is so, you know, sure. such a ridiculous story. So let's talk about Psycon. So this is your first one, yes. I understand it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, how'd you decide to come? Well, knowing that it was the first one that they've had since the pandemic, it, you know, everyone said this is going to be a big deal. It's going to be the big one. And knowing who the guest speakers were going to be, my friend Kenny Biddle, um, Susan Gerbrick was going to be there. And then, of course, uh, Penn and Teller were going to be there. And, you know, if it wasn't for them and for, for James Randi, I probably wouldn't be a skeptic. So I really wanted to make a point to come to meet, you know, new people such as yourself, do what I could to, to help out and contribute to the convention. And, you know, just give give my thanks to the people that, that helped helped me get here. You know, very, Penn, very Barry, you know, Kenny. Kenny's been a fantastic mentor. And, and he did a great talk today. It was his first he, time on the mm-hmm. main stage, although he's, he's done workshops previous years. Yeah, yeah. It was, yeah. Real, it was really good. All right, well, thank you very much for your time. Thank you. from the Data Skeptic Podcast. If you're curious about the way data is changing our world, topics like AI and all this craziness with Facebook and bots and the Twitter storm and how the algorithms that underline that work, uh, and you don't want a technical deep dive, you want it you know, in the vernacular in a way that people can understand, check us out at Data Skeptic. That's what we try and do. I interview advanced professionals in the field who do this sort of research, and then I get into interesting projects as well. We're a weekly show, and you can find us at dataskeptic.com. Now it's time once again to dip into the digital archives from around the world. And as I mentioned at the top of the show, the sad news of the death of uh, Kendrick Frazier, who I had the pleasure of meeting in Albuquerque, New Mexico, a dinner at his house. It was wonderful in the, uh, in the company of uh, Ben Radford and Ken Spartan Ruth. They lived up on, the, um, on a hillside looking uh, over the city of Albuquerque, and it was just a beautiful, beautiful vista. Happy memories. And if we turn to Wikipedia, Kendrick Frazier, born March 1942, was a science writer and longtime editor of the Skeptical Inquirer magazine. He was also a former editor of Science News, author or editor of 10 books, a fellow of the American Association for the Advancement of Science. He was a fellow and a member of the Executive Council of the Committee for Skeptical Inquiry, CSI, an international organization which promotes skeptical inquiry. He has written extensively about a variety of science topics, including astronomy, space exploration, the earth and planetary sciences, archaeology, technology, the history and philosophy of science, public issues of science, and the critical examination of pseudoscience, 
and fringe science. And indeed, right here on the wiki page is a, uh, an example of Ken speaking for himself. Recorded in January 2015. So I'll play that right now. I'm Ken Frazier, and I'm uh, editor of the Skeptical Inquirer magazine. Uh, I got into skepticism from the science side of things, but I was editor of Science News magazine in Washington before that. So I bring a science writer's point of view to skepticism and always have. Um, I've been editor of SI for so long that I'm now almost uh, the grand old man of the skeptical movement, I guess. But it's ironic because I still think of myself as a young person. I guess I'm not really anymore. I have very much appreciated and uh, enjoyed being editor of the Skeptical Inquirer and being a, a part and uh, a contributor to the skeptical movement for a, a good long time now. I'm on the executive council of the Committee for Skeptical Inquiry and uh, also on the board of the Center for Inquiry, which is our overall umbrella organization all in Amherst, New York. Uh, fortunately, I work out of Albuquerque, New Mexico, so I'm in, uh, not at the headquarters location. And uh, one of the fun things about my job is I get to interact with authors and uh, skeptics from all over the world um, who contribute to the skeptical movement through uh, Skeptical Inquirer and other forums. And uh, all the material comes in through me, and then I make decisions of what we're going to publish. And uh, then it goes to other editors. But it's a joy uh, dealing with academics and scholars and investigators who are skeptical from all over the world. It's really quite a an interesting and I think very valuable movement and I'm pleased to be a part of it. Yes, a great loss to the skeptical movement, a very, very nice man to meet and deal with, but let's look back into history and see what some of the news archives, newspaper archives, have written about Kendrick Fraser. And first of all, we find ourselves in the year 1984, in the pages of the Kenosha, Wisconsin News, uh, November the 25th, 1984. Skeptical Inquirer magazine fights claims made by national tabloids, by Charles Hillinger. Copyright 1984, Los Angeles Times. So this is a, uh, a syndicated item because I've also discovered this same report in several other newspapers around the same time. Albuquerque, New Mexico. There are strong grounds to believe there is no such thing as a psychic, insisted Kendrick Frazier, 40, editor of Skeptical Inquirer, a quarterly that evaluates fringe science claims from a responsible scientific point of view. Of course, there are many who call themselves psychic, but neither I nor my colleagues know of anyone who when subjected to good scientific observations under controlled conditions, has been able to demonstrate paranormal abilities, said Frazier, author of two science books and a full-time science writer for Scandia National Lab in Albuquerque, who edits the journal from his home. The Skeptical Inquirer has been published since 1976 by the Buffalo, New York-based Committee for the Scientific Investigations of Claims of the Paranormal, whose stated purpose is, quote, to combat the nonsense published by the National Enquirer, the Globe, the Star, and similar publications in the widespread paranormal craze that has swept the country in recent years. End quote. Topics covered include perpetual motion, the occult, Bigfoot, evolution versus creationism, ESP, conjurers, dowsing, TV pseudo-documentaries, transcendental meditation, clairvoyance, astrology, telekinesis, the use of mental power to make objects move, biorhythms, UFOs, telepathy, the Bermuda Triangle, and other triangles, pyramid power, faith healing, mind reading, levitation, palmistry, poltergeists, and automatic writing. The Committee for the Skeptical Inquirer grew out of a statement disavowing astrology published in 1975 by 
Paul Kurtz, professor of philosophy at the University of New York State, Buffalo, and 191 other leading scientists, including 19 Nobel Prize winners, Frazier said. The panel's 100 members include many of America's most distinguished scientists, psychologists, philosophers, investigative journalists, and magicians. Among them are astronomers Carl Sagan, George Abel of the University of California at Los Angeles, and Edwin C. Krupp, director of the Griffith Park Observatory, Isaac Asimov, author and chemist, Harvard University zoologist Stephen J. Gould, Harvard psychologist B.F. Skinner, anthropologist Laurie Godfrey, scientific American columnist Martin Gardner, and magician James Randi. The Skeptical Inquirer is a labor of love. No one was paid for writing the articles, said Frazier, who worked for the United Press International, the National Academy of Science Newsletter and Science News Magazine, before becoming editor of the publication. He emphasized that everyone is involved out of a sense of intellectual integrity and having great faith in the public's ability to make the right decisions if they have correct information available. Every issue of the Skeptical Inquirer contains articles challenging publications and individuals in the paranormal field. A recent issue quoted a screaming banner headline in The Globe, Bermuda Triangle Gobbling Up Ships and Planes Again. An investigation by the journal was not able to verify a single plane reported by the Globe to have vanished in that area off the Florida coast during the two-year period. A story in the Skeptical Inquirer written by Eugene Emery, science writer for the Providence Journal, commented on a, quote, PM magazine, end quote, TV program a few months ago that aired a film sequence of a cylindrical object identified as a UFO moving across the sky near Cumberland, R.I. This is no hoax, the program's commentator insisted. However, Emery quoted the chief photographer of the Museum of Science in Boston as saying that hoax is written all over it, and identified the object as a small tube suspended on a thin horizontal wire pulled by a thread across the area filmed. As for psychics, Frazier said that one will come along once in a while and make a lucky hit in helping police find a body and get a big splash in the news media. And people are led to believe the person is successful all the time, which is far from the truth. And again, that comes to us from the Kenosha News from Wisconsin, although it was a syndicated piece from Los Angeles, and it was published on the 25th of November, 1984. And our next entry takes place some years earlier, in 1976. 1976, the 26th of July, in the Benton Courier, Benton, Arkansas. Cultist Claims Challenged by Don Oakley. One of the puzzles of our time is why, in an age when science has conquered many major diseases, has sent men to the moon and instruments to the nearer planets, and has put the world into instantaneous communication with itself, we should be witnessing a proliferation of pseudoscientific cults, fringe religious groups, pop psychology movements, and alike. If all these are signs of a society in search of answers to questions which orthodox science and religion ignores, or has no satisfactory answers to, then this has to be the most relentless generation in history, or perhaps the most gullible. Every age has had its similar groups and movements, but the last decade has brought a flood of interest in what is variously called Fringe science, borderline science, pseudoscience, paranormal phenomena, occultism, mysticism, the cults of unreason, the new irrationalism, or the new nonsense. Writes Kendrick Frazier in Science News. Ancient astronauts, astrology, the Bermuda Triangle, UFOs, psychokinesis, psychic healing, Curlian photography, pyramid power, 
reincarnation, immortality, astral projection, lost continents, plant communication. One has to go only as far as the nearest magazine stand to find publications on these and other subjects in abundant quantities. Some 140 Americans are involved in fringe religious cults, such as spiritualism, Hare Krishna, and Scientology, according to the University of Chicago anthropologist Irving Zaretsky, who recently completed a 10-year period as a principal observer in many of these groups. The number may be much larger, says Zaretsky, and it includes a great many respectable middle-class and upper-class people who may also belong to traditional religious groups. It is hard to get accurate numbers because cult participation is often an occasional one-shot experience rather than a continuing membership. So many people are turning to pop psychologies in the 1970s, says Dr. William Rickles, chief of the clinical and psychological laboratory at the Veterans Administration in Sepulveda, California. That... I feel the pop psychological movement is very much taking the place of religion. In what is probably the most publicized example of this phenomenon, Earhart Seminar's training, EST, has, in the four years since it began, processed 70,000 people at $250 each. Similar consciousness industry vendors are doing almost as well. The typical scientist's reaction to all this is usually to throw up his hands in disgust, mutter about the naive and gullibility of the general public, turn back to his experiments and forget about it, says Frazier. But now there is something new on the scene, at least in the field of pseudoscience, he reports. A group of scholars, scientists and investigators determined to challenge the claims of the cultists the formation of a committee for the scientific investigation of claims of the paranormal was announced last spring at a meeting of the American Humanist Association in Buffalo, New York. Perhaps anti-scientific and pseudoscientific irrationalism is a passing fashion, says the committee's co-chairman, Paul Kurtz, professor of philosophy at the State University of New York in Buffalo and editor of The Humanist. Yet one of the best ways to deal with it is for the scientific and educational community to respond in a responsible manner to this alarming growth. The committee intends to function like a consumer information group, providing the public and the news media with access to facts by which they can judge the validity of unusual claims. And that comes to us from 1976, and that is still the case to this very day, uh, especially with groups like um, the uh, Committee for Skeptical Inquiry and the Australian Skeptics. We are here to provide the news media and the public with access to, uh, to our reasoned way of thinking, to the facts of any particular case we happen to know about. Uh, we've all, always considered ourselves to be a resource for the public and the media. And finally, from 1995, on the 28th of August, a very short piece in the Clovis News Journal from Clovis, New Mexico. Right on the front page, it says, FYI, alien abductees. Boulder, Colorado, Associated Press. Aliens are abducting humans, and one of them looks like Irish singer Sinead O'Connor. At least that's the word of a woman who says she was on board an extraterrestrial craft. Leah Halley told her story at the UFO Phenomenon Conference Sunday in Boulder. What they are lacking is any real physical evidence that is irrefutable, said Kendrick Frazier of Albuquerque, editor of The Skeptical Inquirer, a magazine published by the Committee for the Scientific Investigation of Claims of the Paranormal. And if a person has been abducted, a federal crime, why not report it to the FBI? One reason may be that there is a large fine against false reporting, Frazier said. <laughs> 
So there we are, just a couple of news items reported in the pages of the American press about our late friend Kendrick Frazier. And you can see what a, uh, what a wonderful career he had as an editor of the Skeptical Inquirer, and he was there right at the beginning, right at the formation, right in the early days of the, uh, the whole skeptical movement. A great loss, but I think Kendrick lived a, uh, a full and very interesting life indeed. Thank you for listening to the Skeptic Zone podcast this week, and thank you to those listeners who support the show at skepticzone.tv via your Patreon or PayPal contributions. Monthly, weekly, whatever. You can even do a one-off contribution. Whatever you can do certainly does help keep the show going. Now for uh, whatever it is, 14 plus years. Hello? The birds are starting to chirp outside. The sun has come up now. Yes. Although luckily... Being a Sunday morning, it's a bit quiet, and the uh, airport hasn't opened yet. There are lots of aircraft sort of just hovering. Well, they're not hovering. They, they plan it so they're inbound. And just after 6 o'clock, they uh, start to take off and start to land. So to get my recording done before the, uh, the flight traffic is uh, always a good thing. Well, sometimes I'm not awake in time. Coming up on next week's show, I hope to bring you an interview with Zeon Lights, the activist from the UK, and uh, she was a recent guest of ours here in Sydney at Skeptics in the Pub. A very interesting character indeed when it comes to the future of our planet and the energy resources we should be using. Something to look forward to. But for this week, this is Richard Saunders signing off from Sydney, Australia. You've been listening to the Skeptic Zone podcast. Please visit our website at www.skepticzone.tv for show notes, contacts, and to access the back catalogue of episodes going back to 2008. You can follow the Skeptic Zone podcast on Twitter at Skeptic Zone, visit our Facebook page, or leave a review on iTunes. You can also support the Skeptic Zone via Patreon or PayPal. The Skeptic Zone podcast is an independent production. The views and opinions expressed on The Skeptic Zone are not necessarily those of Australian skeptics or any other skeptical organisation. And identified the object as a small tube suspended on a thin horizontal wire pulled by a thread across the. F- <laughs> oh, dear me. <clears throat> Where was I? <laughs> and I. <laughs> and identified the. <laughs> Get it together. <clears throat> and identified the job ob- and identified the object as a small tube suspended on a thin horizontal wire pulled by a thread across the area filmed. People who may also belong to traditional What is it? What is it? I'm trying to record. Hmm? What? What do you want? I'm 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 trying to record the skeptic zone. I know. Hmm? You want to scratch? All right. <laughs> the skeptic zone cards. <laughs>